The next in our series of talking to MHKs on their second year report, David Ashford is with us, and uh, not just, of course, a backbencher, which you were this time last year when we talked to you. And in fact, it's interesting looking back at the interview, and I was prodding you about what you wanted to do. Did you imagine it would be so quick that you, you did have this elevation from literally, well, the fastest I think it's been, isn't it, that it going is. from backbench to, to a ministerial position? Mm -hmm. How was it? Um, I had no inkling at all. As I said in the interview I did with you on the day I became minister, I didn't know myself until that very morning when the chief minister asked me. Um, I think as we joked at the time, everyone else seemed to know and it was yeah. an open secret, but nobody had bothered telling me. Um, but no, so it was, a, it was quite a surprise. Um, I certainly wasn't expecting it. I was carrying on um, with my backbench duties and my duties in the cabinet office. And then when the chief minister asked me to do it, I was delighted to take it up and take up the challenge. This is seen by so many people as a poison chalice. I mean, that, using that old metaphor sort of thing. Don't sit here and tell me it's been an easy ride. And don't tell me things are under control because you, I'm hearing like everyone else that there's all sorts of problems still lurking with over, you know, not enough staff in the hospital, too many people in the, in the wards, you know, stuff that's going on all the time. You're not going to talk to me about it, I'm sure, as such, but it must be quite worrying that you, you, you've got this caseload that doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. Am I got this right or wrong? Well, no, I think there is. I think things are getting somewhere. We've got an integrated care strategy that's been launched and is in place um, and that we're slowly introducing. We've got the new community care division within the department, which has joined up mental health and children and family services. So there's lots going on behind the scenes in the department. Nobles, yeah. in terms of um, where you mentioned in there about beds, on average, the number of vacant beds in any one day is about eight medical beds. So there's no bed crisis at Nobles. And, and, the, no more, crisis? and the more people say it, yeah. isn't going to create one. I, I, and I do, I do um, in, relation to, in relation to staff crisis, yeah. the same as the NHS in the UK, recruitment is a problem. So there is still a much heavier reliance on bank staff and locum staff than certainly I as minister would particularly like, because obviously there's a cost that comes with that. Is the light at the end of the tunnel? I think so. I mean, you started off there by saying about a poison chalice. Uh, well, I've, I know I've never good. subscribed to that, no. to be honest. It's a tough job, and health and social care is always going to be one that arouses passions as well. You've got the biggest budget, have you, almost? It, well, it's the biggest it budget. Biggest, yeah. It's the biggest employer across government as well as a single departmental entity. But also, just as importantly and just as crucially, the services that it delivers at the front end are critical to everyone's day-to-day -day lives. Because without your health, what have you got? So it does arouse passions, and quite rightly so. Have you got the staff on board? I mean, are they working? Are you working as a team? Do you make the decisions? You know, all these sort of questions that people behind the scenes always think, oh, it's all just politics. Uh, yeah, the, the civil servants are running everything. And, yeah, uh, that's that's not true. That's not true at all. As I've said, the book stops with me as minister, ultimately in the department. I think the staff on the ground are doing an excellent job. Um, there's always going to be pressures in health and social care. To be perfectly honest, you could probably treble, quadruple the budget and you still wouldn't be able to do everything that you wanted. Um, so there's always going to be challenges, but I think it's how we adapt and we change and we take on those challenges. You're quite but keen I, on means testing, weren't you, on, on various things. Does that come into uh, prescriptions and that sort of thing? Do you see that that's a, an area that has to be tackled? Well, in terms of prescriptions, we've already come forward with what our proposals would be in terms of the scheme. When we're going to get rid of this crazy idea that was floating around for a while, where you didn't get a free prescription until you were 75, right. where they tied in with the TV licence. I never quite got my head around that. And I asked questions on that, if you remember, when yeah. I was a backbencher. So that crazy idea is going. Where are we? Exactly. Remind me. Because well, in terms of prescriptions, yeah. where we've kept in place um, the actual exemptions that were there before. All those exemptions are there? At the time, at the are, point Are time. they the right ones? I mean, that, isn't that have to keep looking at that? I think that does need to be continuously examined. I think there's, you know, I think the thing with Department of Health and Social Care is you're never going to get to a point where you can stand still. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get to that point where you can sit back and go, oh, well, that's it all done. Is We're it done too cheap? Now. Should they be much more expensive, the prescription charges? I mean, compared uh, with other jurisdictions, we're still pretty light, aren't we? I, can't, I mean, I haven't got a prescription for ages, but I thought we were light. We? Well, it's been a few, quite a few years since the prescription charges last went up. Yeah. And I've made no secret of the fact that when the general scheme comes before Timwald, which will hopefully be in the near future, there are built into that prescription charge increases. And things like a, a, a diabetic. They, 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 they get all their prescriptions still free. Is that the case or what used to be the case? I mean, yeah. things like that, are you going to tidy that up or is that the fair way of doing it? I mean, I, I think in relation to the exemptions, the exemptions should stay in place. Exactly but, what we, but what we need to do is we need to actually get the prescription charges okay. correct. 
that's done with that side of things. What else you got responsibility for these days? Or is that your job? I mean, that's a big job. Is that all you now do? Is the, uh, only, you know, how, how are you finding it besides that? Then? Well, yeah. obviously, uh, it's not the only thing I do. No. Because as well as being a minister, I'm also a member of Council of Ministers. Yeah. So that involves everything let's, coming in from every other department. Let's talk about department. that. Here you go, and you join the club. How was it? Well, I don't see it as a club. I've never seen it as a club, to be The inner honest. circle or whatever it is. Um, yeah. I still have my views. Um, we have oh. debates in Council of Ministers. Heated um, debates? I think, uh, no, I think, I think all the ministers, we put our points across and then we come to an agreed decision. Um, that's the way that most things work. That's how things work in the private sector at a board level. And how do you find that? Because you've got to go with the consensus, right? Even though you might strongly agree, you've got to show this sort of... Uh, we're all together on this. Not in all circumstances. You do get that, if it's right. something, if it's something that obviously you had in your manifesto Have you had at the election. Do anything like that? Yeah. No, I haven't as yet. Um, there was one that maybe came a bit close, but there certainly hasn't. Which one was that? There hasn't been. Which one? I can't talk about what goes on in council <laughs> ministers, and you know that, Paul. Okay. But um, but certainly there's, chance. but there hasn't been. No. Um, and I must say, one of the things is where. Again, that doesn't really always kick in, that thing about, oh, well, you've got to go with the consensus. Certainly my experience, although I've only been in Council of Ministers for seven months, is decisions are made unanimously in general. So we debate something until we get to a consensus. Okay. Uh, constituency work and all that. Yeah. And I think we talked a lot about potholes last time around, which was outside your area. But I, I, you know, things like that completely go out of my mind now, but at the time they're so big, aren't they? What was your big things this year outside of your remit of, of minister, you know, what were you doing for your constituents that really Well, in terms of the in terms of the constituency, a um, couple of the big things have obviously been liaison with Douglas Council over the Williston refurb. Um, there is the potholes, that always comes up. There was issues as well on certain roads in terms of speeding um, and also where WO lines needed to be in place. They all sound very minor things, but they do affect people's day-to-day -day lives. And, and have you got the balance right? Do you find that, I mean, how much work does being the minister take up of, of your day? Well, interestingly, there was a survey, of course, by PAG that a positive action group wrote to all of us. Um, so asking what the split was. It's not always easy answer? to do. I did. I did indeed. Um, and I think from what I, I think if I remember correctly, I said it was about 60-40. So about 60 to 70 percent of my time is now taken up with the minister's job and about 30 to 40 with my constituency work. Um, but in terms of in terms of the balance there, one of the things I did point out at the end of that is that doesn't mean that the amount of constituency work's gone down. It just means you somehow have to fit more hours into the day and I'm sure you to get make out, up for the time. You, I'm sure you get out your manifesto every now and again and go tick that one. Because I think that's we talked about that again last yeah. year, you, you ticked a few things few to go though there is and there's a few more that have been ticked off well, one what's of the, your well one of the big ones that was in my manifesto was over the steam packet where i actually stated quite clearly in my manifesto i believe the Isle of Man government should be taking on the steam packet as our lifeline that it was crazy as an island nation that we had no control over our primary route so you got that one so that one's ticked off now um public sector pensions which i've raised um that's now obviously the initial report went to tim Wood in july um, and there'll be further options coming forward from the minister of policy and reform shortly as i stated in the debate in july i still believe that a defined contribution scheme is the way forward that hasn't changed so you'll be delighted to know paul just because i've become a minister doesn't mean all my views have suddenly uh, magically changed would i think that uh, they haven't no. What I state in my manifesto is what I still believe, mm -hmm. um, and it's still what I'm campaigning. Still got a smile on your face. I mean, that's, I mean, two years in, how is it feeling? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with it. Um, you know, the judgment will be of the Douglas North constituents at the next election. If I decide to stand, if I decide to stand again, they might decide they've had enough and uh, go for someone different. Do you see yourself being in health though for the duration now? Well, that's obviously at the behest of the oh, yeah. chief minister. Do but, you um, see yourself? Though? You know, I would, I would, would like certainly, I would it? certainly like to keep it for this term. Yeah. I think one of the things the department needs is stability. Mm -hmm. I think there has been a lot of chopping and changing, and I think it's important that there is some stability, and that's something that I've been trying to bring to the department. And would you say you're an accessible MHK? I would hope so. Um, I certainly myself feel I'm accessible. Um, I'm certainly contactable. You know, I've got my phone details out there, my mobile details out there. There's email. There's Facebook. Yeah. You know, there's every everything under the sun to get hold of me. Um, but I'd like to think I am approachable, and people can talk to me. I can't always give them the result that they want, or tell them what they want to hear. 
but I would hope that I am an approachable individual. Do you feel you have confidence in the way, way everything is going? I mean, I say you're in the, in the sanctum now. Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, obviously with government, one of the frustrations is, you know, the speed of things. So things don't necessarily move as fast as you would like and certainly as fast as you say you would experience in the private sector where a decision is made and then it suddenly happens because you've got obviously Tim Ward and everything alongside that in a parliamentary process and a democracy to contend with. Um, but I think it is heading in the right direction. I think there's things... Um, that are coming up, such as the Liverpool landing stage, where we're securing our berth in Liverpool by actually owning owning it, rather than at the moment where we're subject to other companies' whims. You relax about a buying the steam packet, obviously the cost there, and and what thirty up to thirty million on this landing stage. You, you relax about that. I am because I think it's actually a wise investment because it's securing our lifeline. And I think, you know, what we can't go on, I've said this for many years, even when I was on Douglas Council, you can't keep going on having to be at the behest of other people, particularly when you're dealing with that. But where do you stop? Do you want the airlines nationalised? Do you want the Manx airlines back? You well, know, in my, by well, in my manifesto, oh. actually, in relation to airlines... Sorry, I can't remember um, everything about your manifesto. No, yeah. What was it, that? It obviously wasn't that good a read. No, no, no. But, uh, um, in relation to airlines, I yeah. said that I'm not sure that the open skies policy has necessarily worked as well as it should. And in my manifesto, I stated that I think we should be looking at maybe closed routes for certain of the key routes. Oh. So open skies for those that are more general routes. And then our key strategic routes should be closed to one airline running them on a um, for a period. We must talk time. about that in more detail some other time, I think, because that's, that's, that's a massive undertaking to, you know, EasyJet, V, Fly B and all those sort mm -hmm. of things. But, you can, I mean, Guernsey does still have uh, Arini, doesn't it? But they, they lose lots of money and they've, had, yeah. they've, they've sort of opened up their sky slightly recently, didn't they? Besides a key route, which I think is probably what you say, yeah. sort of halfway house maybe. I, I think one of the things to point out as well, though, I mean, you talked about nationalising the airlines. Yeah. I wouldn't be in favour of that. I don't think a government-run airline. Um, oh, I, think okay. it, I think it would soak up taxpayers' money. Yeah. Uh, Manx Airlines, which you mentioned, although they were named Manx Airlines, they, they, they were, were they were still a private sure. company. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, Unfortunately, it's for some, because then the BA bought, bought them, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, but, but I think, you know, I think if you started going down the route of taxpayer-owned okay. airlines, um, you're, you, no, no pun intended, but uh, the cost to the taxpayer would probably rocket. Fine. Well, let's have some numbers. Uh, last year, you, do you remember what you gave yourself last year? Last year, I gave myself a steady seven. I think yeah, we described that as. Safe seven or something. Safe seven yeah, or steady seven, steady seven. And I would do the same again. So that I, means there's room for improvement. I think there is. I, I think there's always room for improvement. Okay. Um, anyone who knows me knows I can be quite self-critical of myself sometimes. And I think that uh, I, I think we're still a long way off um, yet. There's three years still to go. Of and this administration. I remind you, the government was eight, I think you said. Yes. That one. Yeah. I would keep it at the eight, right. to be honest, because again, I think things are moving in the right direction. And I think, as I said last year, this would be the year to prove, um, you know, prove that things are moving in the right direction. We've got the public sector pensions initial report there, which is something that previous administrations have shied away from um, in, in total. Uh, so that's there now and we are moving down the options routes but it's once those things start clicking into place and actually being delivered that's what will deliver a real change. And how are you getting on with everybody? You know, Did that change when you became the Minister? No, uh, no, I've not changed any of my relationships with my colleagues. Um, in you, fact, I, you've got your favourites, ones you don't like, I mean you speak no, to everyone? Uh, yeah, I speak to everyone. I mean, it, yeah. I, it's a, you know... Uh, but there has been people, some... People have arguments in the chamber. And it can be very heated arguments sometimes. But the thing is, people don't take it personally. You have your debates in there, you go outside, and you're perfect present. I don't take things personally. You know, people can call me what they like in the chamber, and, you know, I don't take that to heart. You are a career politician then, aren't you now? No, I wouldn't say so. You still think you might I still, I, I, I heard you say earlier. Say, but, yeah. uh, you know, I, I still I, don't think so. Mm. Well, time will tell, well, as they say. Had you, can, a, you can throw that back at me maybe well, in the we'll, future. We've got next uh, year yeah. and the year after. <laughs> but uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you know, how it goes. Thank you very much, Paul.